Let's, uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads and <clears throat> pray together. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name tonight, and we thank you for this great privilege to be together again with our Bibles open. Lord, I, uh, I would like to say also our hearts open. Do pray that you would speak to us and meet with us. We thank you for being so incredibly good to us. Thank you for your mercies that were new this morning and will be new again tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 16. We need to pick it up about halfway through. We're going to start off in verse 18, but let me give you a little bit of run-up to that. Jesus has asked his disciples who men say that he is, and then they gave him the various guesses. Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Blessed art thou. The Father has shown this to you. All right, so this is a great revelation. And I showed you last time how multiple people played a part in communicating that revelation to Peter. But nevertheless, it was the Father that was the great architect of that revelation and led those various people to come into Peter's life. So verse 18, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. All right, real quick, he got a new name. This is the first time, chronologically speaking, that Peter hears this new name in this language. In John chapter 1, we, we looked at it last time where Jesus met Peter for the first time, or met, let's say, Simon for the first time, and said, your name shall be called Kephas. Right, but that was the Aramaic version of it. Now he says, thou, thou art Peter. So this is the Greek form of that same word that means a stone. Now, go, as you read through your Bible, just pay attention where God gives somebody a new name because there's always something transformative going on in that person's life. And the, and the name change signifies this great turning point in their life. So can you think of some people in the, in the Bible that have a name change? Abraham, Paul. You know, with Paul's, Paul actually had two names working concurrently. One was a Roman name, another one a Hebrew name. Saul was the Hebrew version, and Paul was the more Roman version of that. But Abram went to Abraham. Abraham. And then you have Sarai to Sarah. And, and then you have? Not, not Isaac. No. You have Jacob. Yeah, Jacob to Israel. So th there are some name changes that take place in the Bible. And those are, it actually makes for a nice sermon if you want to go through and find those places in the Bible where a name change has taken place. Um, you don't find anywhere in the New Testament that says when we get saved, we get a, a new name automatically. There's a hint of it, however. Nothing directly says that, but in Revelation, you read about the people that overcome, they have a new name written down on a stone and this and that. So I hesitate to say that that has a lot of doctrinal meaning for us, but we do get a really good song out of it. Uh, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed choirs sing the story, and, and on it goes. So it's a great song, it's a nice thought. Uh, that when you get saved, you're a new person, and hence the new name. Now, with, with Peter, this doesn't designate him getting saved. This is just a designation that your spiritual life has been taken up a notch. Right, this, forgive me for switching into the dark mode on this, this is where the Roman Catholic Church gets the idea that when a man becomes the Pope, you give him a new name. So if you've studied the history of this, all these popes have just a regular name based on whatever nation they were from, but as soon as they take the Vatican's throne, they get a new name, and they get to choose it, I believe. So this is where they get that idea. All right, thou art Peter. Sorry, that's ringing quite a bit. Let's see if I can change that a little. All right, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. When Jesus says upon this rock, guys, watch this, he's not pointing at Peter. He pointed at Peter when he said, thou art Peter. And then he says, when upon this rock, He's pointing at himself. Now, let me show you another case in the Bible where Jesus did this. Okay, look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And let's get verse number 18. John 2, 18. <clears throat> Jesus has just cleaned out the temple. And he says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, look at what the Jews thought he was talking about. Verse 20, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, 
and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So in verse 19, when Jesus said, destroy this temple, look at what he's doing. He's pointing inward. He's not pointing at the temple. Even though that was the, the focus of the previous discussion, Jesus moves the focus to him. So this is not unusual for Jesus to do such a thing. Back to Matthew 16. So thou art Peter, and upon this rock, pointing to himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I gave you a few thoughts on this verse last week. I'll give you just a couple more now. Let me remind you, first of all, the gates of hell, I, I believe there's a literal meaning to that, that it's the actual gates of hell that could not keep Jesus in. So when it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it can be, in the literal sense, pointing to the rock. And when the rock, who is Jesus, goes into hell because he did, the gates of hell cannot keep him there. Uh, he cannot be held by that, Acts chapter 2 and Re Revelation chapter 1. But then there's also the allegorical meaning. And I think both things are true at the same time. God is obviously deep enough to say two things with one sentence. God often does that. There's a preacher, I've supported him for years, ever since I got saved. His name's David Spurgeon. He was a, a motorcycle gang leader for years and got caught running drugs and faced, you know, pretty much the rest of his life in prison, got saved in prison. And uh, man, the Lord just changed him and called him to be an evangelist. And he's a good preacher. He got up and preached one time. The name of the sermon was called God Can Chew Bubblegum and Walk at the Same Time. It was God Can Walk and Chew Bubblegum at the Same Time. And, and all, his sermon was going through scripture showing us where one verse can mean two things. And, and brilliant stuff. And I think this is an example of that. So literally, gates of hell couldn't keep Jesus in. But also, if you think about the gates of hell allegorically, speaking about the, the powers of spiritual darkness, not prevailing against the church. That is also true. That, that you can bear out that truth throughout the New Testament. No matter what the devil throws at us, we have a shield that can quench any fiery dart. So wh whether Jesus is speaking allegorically or literally, both things are true. I have no problems either way. All right, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let's, let's talk for a moment about this church that he's building. He said, I will build my church. Jesus is still in the midst of a building project. Now, praise God, we had a building project last year, and I had so many pastors tell me before we started, Brother Mike, hold on to your hat. This is going to get tough. Building projects are always a time of, you know, spiritual tension and all sorts of surprises and this and that. And, and granted, we had a few, but man, praise God. All, all things considered, the building project went really well. Now, we still have a few odds and ends, things that we're trying to get done, and as the money comes in, we do it. I think when it comes to a building such as this, you're going to be tinkering probably until the rapture, you know, just trying to, trying to morph it into what it needs to be. It, it, it just takes a different shape, and that's fine. The church of Jesus Christ, right, it, it took shape in the book of Acts, but he is still adding to it. It is still growing to this day. So Jesus is still in the midst of a building project. Question is, are you helping with that project, right? Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble. So you're building on it whether you like it or not. You just want to bring the right product. Look at Acts chapter 2 quickly. I just want to make a couple comments about the importance of the church. Jesus is building a church. I want to be a part of it. I don't want to be outside of that. I want to be right. If he's building it, it's got to be important. He built it for a reason, guys. It is the bastion of the truth. This is, what, this is the vehicle that God uses to protect and promote the truth. Think of this. Think of if we didn't have a church. And everybody is just a renegade believer. Right? So you're going to step out and give your testimony. And Jesus said this, and Jesus said that, and this is what I feel. Okay, great. How do we prove him right or wrong? I don't know. I, that's his experience. And then we get the next guy says, well, I love Jesus too, but Jesus told me this. And then the story's a little different. No, if everybody's just on their own, how do we know who's got the right Jesus? And the, because 
eventually the stories are going to bump into each other. This is precisely what the early church ran into. It was inevitable that people are going to start having some emotional experiences. They're excited. They mean well. They tell the story, but then that story doesn't really line up. How did they know which person was right and which was wrong? How did they try these people to see whether or not they were apostles? Remember that in Revelation 2? You have to have a standard. You have to have a final authority. So, yes, the church is there. It's organized to hang on to and lift up the scriptures. It is the pillar and ground of the truth. And that's why every local church gets organized around the scripture. That becomes your plumb bob, if you will, the plumb line by which we, we measure everything. There's a great revelation given. Now, how do we protect that great revelation? How do we best promote it to the world through the vehicle of the church? It's not that God can't use us on an individual basis, but the church adds a great layer of protection and promotion to truth. All right, look at Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 47. Here's the day of Pentecost. This is the day the body of Christ started. Now, how do we know that? The Holy Ghost came down. And for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The body of Christ started when the Holy Spirit came down. The body of Christ is also called the church. So what you have in Acts chapter 2 is the organization, or let's say the, the formation of the universal church. The body of Christ starts. The local church was already there. The local church, Jesus formed with his disciples. They were already praying together. They were already searching the scriptures, trying to find out what do we do? How do we replace this man who fell, Judas, and how do we fill his position? The local church was already going. So now, Acts 2... People start getting saved, 3,000. How do we organize them? Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the what? He added to the church daily such as should be saved. So a man gets saved. You know what God told him to do? Go to church. Go to church. Why? Because there we have an organized effort. We have structure that will help you grow. If you've ever done much gardening, I haven't, but I know a little bit about it. If you want vines to grow well, you need to give it some structure to climb. And those vines will climb whatever structure you put it near. And you can read in the book of Psalms where children are like vines. And the children of God are like vines. And the local church, guided by the Bible, is an upright structure and allows those people to grow pop properly. Now come to the last page of the Bible, chapter 22, Revelation. We'll dig into this more when we get to the book of Revelation in Bible school. But in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you read about seven different churches. And those churches exist in the future, in the tribulation time. Even into the tribulation, God still is working through a church. Now, throughout that chapter, or those two chapters, you know what it says? He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to thee. Churches, you know what? where God's going to communicate a message? He's going to speak to the church and then allow the church to hold up that truth for the world because it is a safe way to guard and promote that revelation. Now, Revelation 22, we get verse 16. Closing of the book here. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the what? Churches. Churches, that's plural. So what does that mean? Local church. The body of Christ is singular. If he says churches, that's plural. All the way to the last page of the Bible, God is still saying, I'm speaking through churches. I'm giving this revelation to them. I trust that they will pass it on properly. So the next verse, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say come. When he gives us revelation, what do we do with it? We use that to invite other people to come to Christ. That's, that's one of the main goals of a church. All right, much more we could say on that, but I'll save that sermon for another day. Come back to Matthew now, chapter 16. And verse 19. Verse 19 says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Right, this is where the, the, all the jokes come from, that when you die, you meet Peter at the pearly gates, and he's the one that can open the gates or close the gates. And I, that's just a gross misunderstanding and 
and horrible oversimplification of this verse. And I, I mentioned this last time, this is review, but the kingdom of heaven is not heaven. Once you know that, you automatically know Peter's not up at heaven guarding the gate, letting people in or out or that, you know, keeping people out. So what are we dealing with here? Now look at Luke chapter 12, and let's let the Bible define itself. The keys of the kingdom of heaven, what is that? Luke chapter 12. Oh, I'm sorry, Luke 11, forgive me. Luke 11, verse 52. All right, Luke 11 and verse 52. All right, so Jesus says here, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of what? Knowledge. The Bible tells us what the key is. It's, it's knowledge. The key of knowledge, ye, ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. Why? Because the Pharisees and lawyers and scribes were not teaching any sort of truth or gospel or anything like that. So they, they were just teaching tradition, their own traditions. So the, the keys that God is giving to Peter is, is revelation. It is knowledge. He's saying, Peter, it, it links, if you get the context back in Matthew 16, it links back to verses 16 and 17. I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. All right, you're going to need to know more than just Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is building a church. You need to know more than that, right? But he says, Peter, I am equipping you so that you will understand how human beings can find forgiveness. Now, I'm going to show you this as we go on in the passage. But, and, and there's two ways, the, the horizontal and the vertical how we can properly forgive one another because if we, if we forgive each other now while we're on the earth, that thing's loosed in heaven, done. If we hold on to that grudge and we bind it on earth, it's bound in heaven and we're going to have to deal with it later. So the forgiveness of sins is a big deal horizontally, person to person. But obviously more important is the vertical situation. How do we find forgiveness with God? So just let your eyes drift down Verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things. You know what he's going to tell them? I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. So you, you know what Peter's getting here? A along with, mind you, all the other apostles, he's getting some brand new revelation. No one had ever heard this before, what Jesus is telling them. That's where it says Jesus began. From that time forth began Jesus. He's now starting to publicly explain his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, now we're getting into how we find forgiveness of sins and how we find a way into the kingdom. You, you can't enter the kingdom lest you've been forgiven. All right, so take your Bible, come to Colossians chapter 1. Anytime you go out soul winning and you tell a sinner how they can be forgiven by God, you know what you're doing for them. You're opening up a path for them to get into the kingdom. Right? How about we draw this together? John 3.3. 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right? If you're not born of God, then you can't enter the kingdom. You must be born again. Well, part of, when somebody receives Jesus Christ, yes, the new birth happens, but... At the same time, they're receiving forgiveness of sins, yes? And you cannot enter the kingdom lest you have been regenerated and washed in the blood. And all of that is a package deal you get through Christ. So by Peter and the other apostles learning this revelation that Jesus is the Son of God and he is going to die, and that's the only way into the kingdom, he says, guys, I am properly equipping you. I'm giving you the keys. You can open up the kingdom for somebody. And... You have a way now, now that you know how God's forgiven you, now you can forgive each other that way, and that simply improves your position in the kingdom, right? If, if you have that good fellowship one with another. So look at Colossians 1, see the connection here. Verse 12 down to 14. Colossians 1 verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That inheritance speaks to, well, eventually the fulfillment is in the kingdom. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness 
and hath translated us into the what? Into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, what is involved in being in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? Right, right now, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the what? Forgiveness of sins. You see how all of that goes together. All right, so come back to the book of Matthew. Let me give you another thought on this. Matthew chapter 18. Now, forgive me, I, we, we can't go over this passage without speaking about how some people have twisted the verse. But the Roman Catholic Church uses Matthew 16 and verse 19 to say, the Pope has the power to forbid you entering into heaven. And that power is then delegated to the priesthood. So they are the ones, when you enter into that spooky little dark box, you have to confess your sins to that priest. And the priest has been authorized by the Pope, who was authorized by Christ, who was authorized by God. So that priest is able to forgive your sins in the eternal sense. And if the Pope were to decide, you, I don't want to forgive you, he can deny you heaven. And, and it's not just one Pope. It's not some renegade, rogue Pope that did this. Several Popes stood up to this claim and, and accepted this to say, you cannot achieve heaven without the Roman Catholic Church. And you cannot achieve heaven without following the Pope's commands and blessings and revelations. There, many popes have spoken to that, that dogma of the Catholic Church. So Matthew 16, the idea that Peter was the first pope, the church was built on Peter, and Peter has the keys to heaven, and Peter's the one that can offer forgiveness, so everything flows down from the pope's footstool. So you see how that thing gets twisted. Now, it all starts with misunderstanding Peter as a pet, Petros, and the rock as a Petra, and it all starts with that. But nevertheless, let me show you Matthew 18. The Catholic Church will make a big deal and say the keys were given to Peter. That, that's the claim. The keys were given to Peter. Is that true in Matthew 16? It, it does say unto thee. Uh, yay, yo. It, that, it is singular. So, okay, if all we had was Matthew 16, we'd have to scratch our heads a bit and go, hmm, maybe. But that's not all we have. So they'll say, Peter, first pope, keys given to him. But Matthew 18, verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever, what's that next word? What's that pronoun? Ye, that is yalla. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now who's he talking to in this passage? Verse 15 down to 17. He's talking about the church. He's talking about how a brother can find forgiveness within a church. And, and you see that in verse 17. If he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. So this idea of forgiving one another, binding on earth or loosing in heaven, you know, however that goes, that is something, yes, it was given to Peter, but it's not only for him. The entire church is able to do that. The revelation of how we find forgiveness was given to those apostles. Then the apostles teach the church how to do it. And that is something passed down to us now. We still should be practicing such church discipline even now. All right, Matthew 16, let's come back to that. All right, verse 20, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. <laughs> Isn't that strange? Here's this great revelation. Man, God showed you something. God's going to use you. You open up heaven. <laughs> I mean, this, and now don't tell anyone. <laughs> Lord. Don't hamstring me. Right when you told me to run, then you hamstring me. How, how are you going to do that? Okay, yes, it is great revelation. But, but guys, there's a timing issue to this. If Peter runs off now and start Now, Peter, people were already believing, they were already preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. John the Baptist was saying it. The Samaritans in John 4 believed that. They were proclaiming that. The apostles had already been saying this as they went out on their preaching tours. It's not as if they hadn't been. But now he's saying, guys, I know you're learning, and I'm about to show you even more. And I think it's not just what he said about, I'm going to build a church and all of that, but what he's about to say. He says, guys, I'm going to show you some things about the Messiah that you guys haven't even understood yet. And I don't want, if you stand up and start pro, uh, publicly proclaiming this, you are going to bring up more questions than you're able to answer at this time. Because this is just going to be mind-blowing even for you guys. So you guys need to wrap your own heads around this before you start preaching it to others. 
Doesn't that make sense? I know when I first got saved, I'd hear something in church. Man, it made sense to me, right? My pastor would say it, and I'd go, ooh, praise God. And the whole church is amen, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's got to be right. And I'd go out witnessing to somebody and say, you know, Bible says, God said. And they go, where does it say that? How do you know that? And I go, uh, my pastor said it. I mean, that's just not a good answer. It's not a satisfying answer. I, I wasn't ready to be the one out there revealing that. I needed some time to get that truth kind of wrapped around my head a little bit. All right, so verse number 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, as I said, this is when he began to publicly proclaim this. He had alluded to this on many occasions beforehand. But now he's straight out telling them, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. Now, we can find these truths in the Old Testament, right? You and I, we can go back in the book of Psalms and Isaiah and many places, and we find the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But th these are mysteries that are now, they have been revealed. Now they are historical facts that we can turn back to, and we can see how history and prophecy have lined up with each other. If you put yourself in the shoes of these apostles, bear in mind, these guys are not biblical scholars, right? They're, they're a little bit limited in their knowledge of the scripture. Not, not that they were ignorant, but they weren't deep scholars at this point by, by any means. They're learning. But even after Jesus rises again, look at John chapter 20. This truth took some time to sink in. Now, how many of you come into Bible school this year, you've heard something that you've never heard before, and you still scratch your head a little bit thinking about, how, is that, how does that work, right? Well, welcome to the club. That's, <laughs> this is where you got to start somewhere. you got to hear it for the first time somewhere, and then you marinate in it for a while and it sinks in. John 20, let's look at verse uh, 8 and 9. All right, Mary has gone back and said Jesus is gone. So Peter and John take off running. Verse 8, then went in also that other disciple, which is John, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they, Peter and John, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. But Jesus just told them that in Matthew 16, right a year before it happened. He said, guys, this is what's going to take place. They had not yet put together, okay, yes, they knew Jesus said that. They didn't know the scripture on it. So they, they had not yet put together Psalm 16 and Isaiah 53 and, and how all of that spoke to the resurrection. So here it is, the event has happened, and they still don't believe it because they haven't put it all together. Now we're going to see another case of Peter not believing it. Come back to Matthew 16 here. So Jesus is beginning here to reveal this, and he, he shows it unto his disciples, not to everybody. He doesn't say this out in the temple or in, to the multitude. Verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Oh, you're never, you're never going to win that. <laughs> Standing back going, Jesus, no, 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 that can't be. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> you never want to be on that end of the conversation. He began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, what's Peter doing? Peter's just being a good friend. He loves the Lord. He does, right? He loves the Lord. He doesn't want anything bad to happen to his master. That, that's all that this is. Uh, uh, it's a strong friendship. It's a great devotion. Now, careful here, because this is where a lot of Christians get, get this confused, I think. They believe their good intentions equals the will of God. So if I mean well, that must be the will of God. You, I'm not going to say you never get that right. Sometimes you... Doing the best you can is honestly all that God expects. But there are so many times, and this is a great case, where Jesus says, guys, this is how it's going to be. This is not going to end up well. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. You're going to be without your master. Right? Okay. That is not the way Peter wants life to turn out. And sometimes that's how it goes. You don't get everything you want. Right? So Peter, in all his best intention, let me protect the Lord. And sometimes when God has already revealed, no, that's not the plan. This man has to suffer. 
as much as that breaks your heart, you have to let that go and say, Lord, if, if this is what you've told me or this other person to do, then I'm just going to stand back and pray for them and help them in whatever way, but I'm not going to go against the plan. But Peter, good intentions and all, making a mess of it here. So look at what Jesus says to him in verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, who? How's that for the first pope? <laughs> hey, hey, Satan, get back. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he's, just, he's just been greatly blessed, and it didn't take, what, five minutes, and the devil was already in there. This is why you need a church, <laughs> to protect and promote the truth and say, hey, Peter, you're getting out of line. Jesus said this is going to happen. Peter, you're good intentions, but you're trying to make something else happen. Stay in line with what Jesus said we should be doing. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art uh, an offense unto me. An offense is a stumbling block. So here, what's the stumbling block? The devil is, is playing on Peter's strong emotional attachment to his master. The devil is using Peter's good intentions against him. And, and causing, trying, even tempting Jesus to stumble. To say, hey, don't go through with this. You don't have to go die. Because now here's another person voting against the will of God. So it's not as if Jesus is actually considering not going through with it. But, th but that's what the devil's trying to do. Is to get Jesus to walk away from the cross. So thou art an offense unto me. For thou, the devil, savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So I have a note in my Bible here that says, The will of God always trumps the kindness of men. I, I'm all for being nice. I'm all for good intentions. But th the devil, understand what his plan is here. He just wants you to act like a man. He, he wants you to act like a human being. That's it. Now, if he, can, he, if he can get you to do that, to just act upon your best wishes, your best intentions, to do things in your own wisdom, in your own strength, then you, now you have somebody that will get ra rooted and grounded in their own self-righteousness. And that pushes you farther away from God than you ever could be. Right? Because uh, I mean, well, I'm trying to help. H have you ever tried to minister to somebody that is not saved, but is genuinely trying to be a good person? They are tough nuts to crack. It is tough to show them that they need to change because they're living better lives than most Christians. How do you show them that they're on the wrong path? Your righteousness is not enough. That They're in the same boat with Peter. Of, I'm trying to do right. Yeah, but you're not doing it God's way. So, so what, would, what does the average man want? The average man, talking the general situation, wants to be comfortable, wants to live a life that is unmolested. We don't want persecution. We just want to stay out of everybody's way. You mind your business. I'll mind mine. Listen, I, I won't persecute you. You won't persecute me. Let's not judge each other. Let's just all get along. I just want to have wife, kids, white picket fence, nice house, comfortable life, retire, enjoy my life, die a happy death, right? Mm -hmm. But look what Jesus is going to tell us here. Verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Saying, guys, listen, th th when it comes to following God, you don't always get the white picket fence. Your dreams don't always come true. Now, it, it, it'll, it'll surprise you. Because in, in our minds, it is against our human nature to think like this. To think if my dreams fall through, how could I possibly be happy? Because the will of God is so much more satisfying. To know that you are doing what God wants you to do. There's just something so rich and deep and eternally satisfying about that. But this is where Peter was going wrong. He didn't take time to think about what God wanted. He was just acting upon what he wanted. It is not that what he wanted was bad. It just wasn't the will of God. And that's where the devil will get somebody in a Bible school to go wrong. Uh, and and I, I speak this carefully because I, I've seen Bible school students go out to the far country. I've seen Bible school students end up drunk and running around with women and doing awful stuff. But generally, you know where people get messed up in a Bible school? is they have good intentions, but they just ever so slightly get out of the will of God and start to do what they think they should do instead of what God told them to do. And the devil gets in there and messes with your best intentions. Rather deny yourself, take up the cross, and say, here's my will, there's God's will, 
And when they cross, not my will, but thine be done. And then follow on. Verse 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. All right, now think this through with me. Verse 25, whosoever will save his life. All right, I'm going to strive and work and, and labor and worry and do whatever I need to do to make my dreams work out. Keep my job, keep the money, keep the family, keep it just the way I want it. That's the man saving his life. You know what he's going to do? Lose it. Because eventually it's all going to pass away. It, it's it's going to be finished eventually. I challenge couples whenever I do pre-marriage counseling. We have a lesson called life planning. And I challenge couples to make a plan for the rest of their life. And I tell them, make a plan for where you want your marriage to be in five years. Make a plan for 20 years. Where do you want your marriage to be in 50 years? Where do you want your marriage to be in 100 years? I said it yesterday to a couple. You know what the response was? I don't think I'm going to be here in 100 years. I said, that's the point. And I want you to make a plan for that. Because, listen, didn't Jesus say, lay up treasure in heaven? You better think about the other side of this life. And you better plan for that. But if all you do is strive and labor to save this current life, then you have nothing on the other side. And that's where you lose it. He says at the end of verse 25, whosoever will lose his life, I have these three words underlined, for my sake. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Many people have lost their life for the wrong cause. And, and, and when I say wrong cause, let me be careful there. Yes, sometimes it's a wrong cause. Sometimes it's a good cause. You know, there's soldiers that go out to war defending their country. That's a good cause. There's men that have stood up against an attacker coming into their home. That's a good cause, right? But, but that's a different category than Jesus saying, this is what I want you to do for me. And you saying, okay, I'll give up whatever I had going in my life. I'll leave that behind and head out for you. I remember after I got saved, my dad came to visit me in Texas. And he sat down with me. And he, I had a good job. Christina and I were working at the same company and making good money. God calls us to go to Bible school. And we're about to head off and you know, pack up everything we own into two little cars and drive off, you know, what was it, 12 hours to get to Pensacola, something like that, 10 hours, something like that. And we got there, and I was going to go back to work at McDonald's. This is a massive demotion, you know. My dad is worried. And I think as a nat the natural man, he looks at this and says, son, you're joining a cult. Why? Because they're making you give up everything and go back to McDonald's. And, you know, McDonald's is not a cult. <laughs> but, but in his mind, he thought, how? Well, this doesn't make sense. Now, you know what, how my dad's thinking? Like, just like a man. That's what the natural man, hey, no, son, you're supposed to get a better job and get more money. And No, dad, I'm supposed to find the will of God. And then whatever that costs me is well worth it. And we make that sacrifice. Verse 26, for what is a man, I'm sorry, for what, yeah, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That is a great verse. If you ever go preaching on the streets, that's a great verse to use. I, I have found it so helpful when preaching in public to use verses that have a question mark in it. Because if you can leave the person with a question in their mind, it'll make them think as they walk off. Even when you do one-on-one -on -one evangelism, great thing to do. Leave them with a question. The Bible says you must be born again. My friend, have you been born again? And as that person walks by, they go, huh. I don't know what that means. And then they start thinking about it. Great, great way to get people thinking. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So what, what, is, what is eternity worth to you? That's kind of the question he's asking. If you do gain the whole world, is that worth your soul? We, we get such a skewed ver a vision of this in our minds because we're just not eternally minded. It's hard for us to fathom eternity. right? I know when you're young, you think, man, when am I ever going to get old enough to do anything? And then when you get old enough to do something, time just like triples in speed. And then by the time you're heading, it's like a slippery slope going down to the grave. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're there. And one day the doors of eternity are going to open. And then you're going to wonder, man, all that stuff that I gathered, for what? For what? The book of Ecclesiastes is brilliant on this. 
brilliant to, to give you that balance, to say all this stuff you'd gathered, when you die, you're going to leave it to somebody after you that's probably going to waste it. <laughs> all that labor for what? Right? And this is where Jesus says, listen, don't, don't waste your life laying up stuff on earth. Lay something up on the other side. He's getting his apostles to think eternally. Verse 27, for the Son of Man shall come. You see what he's doing? Think eternally. Guys, don't think that this life is all you got. Because one day the Son of Man is going to come. There's going to be a kingdom. There's more to it than just these 60, 70 years you got. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Getting them to think uh, long term, to think eternally. So guys, I'm going to reward you for whatever sacrifices you make. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. That's one of the famous uh, verses in the Bible that people, critics, like to pick on and say, Well, you see, this is a failed prophecy because the men that were standing there listening to Him, all of them died. And Jesus never came back and set up his kingdom. I said, what do we do with this? Is this a failed prophecy? Now, there are two ways that I've heard Christians handle this. And one, one side is more the all-millennial, preterist type view. And that uh, many of the Reformed churches approach it like this. They'll say that before the apostles died, Jesus did set up his kingdom. The kingdom was set up through the church. So the church equals the kingdom. And how many of you have heard somebody say things like this, we're busy building the kingdom? Okay, now that can be a true statement if you use it correctly. You've got to have the right context with that. But most of the time when people say that, what they mean is we're, we're building the church, making the church bigger, and ergo we're building the kingdom. Because in their minds, the kingdom and the church is the same thing. The church has replaced Israel. So now if you're building the church, you're building the kingdom, so the kingdom is going to get bigger and bigger through our evangelistic efforts. We are going to bring the kingdom in to its fullest complete, completed state. See, but the kingdom was established on the earth before the apostles died. So that's, that's one approach. But in verse 27, Jesus tells us something about this. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. The kingdom he's referring to, right, is that earthly kingdom. He's, he's coming. He's physically coming. That's what he's talking about there. So I, just within the context, I'm going to reject what, the, what that amillennial preterist view would be. All right, so what's the other approach? Well, I, this is my approach, and this is, I've heard this not just from me. There's plenty of people also take this approach. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple places. Get Luke chapter 9. Get Luke 9 in your left hand. In your right hand, get 2 Peter chapter 1. And then in your other hand, keep Matthew 17. And we're going to look at all those spots there. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll begin reading at verse 16 there. All right, 2 Peter and Luke chapter 9. All right, everybody got that? Okay. I want you to have, you see how I'm doing this? We can hold it in, in with all these fingers here. You just, there's your book markers. Look at Matthew 16 again. Now look at the very end of it. Till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, verse 27, what did he say? The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. All right, look at chapter 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Now, that word and... It connects the two chapters. Jesus made this statement about some standing here, not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. How does that story end? And after six days, Jesus took him up, and that's how the story ends. We're going to, right there in the context, it shows us the connection that Jesus was trying to make. Now, Matthew's gospel gives us plenty of information. Luke's gospel gives us some additional information. So take a look, Luke 9, verse 28. Well, I'll tell you what, get 27, you'll see same context. 
27, But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And it came to pass, about an eight days after these sayings. Do you see that phrase, after these? He's connecting what he said a week ago to what's happening right now. So it tells us that what I just said about not tasting death and you're going to see it, now you're going to see it. Okay? So verse 28 again, came to pass about in eight days. Now guys, while we're looking at it, I want to show it to you. Okay? Matthew 17 verse 1, it says after six days. And then Luke 9, 28, about eight days after. So which one is it? Is it six days or is it eight days? It's neither. <laughs> it's neither. Look, look at it. Matthew 17 one after six days. What comes after six? Seven. And then about eight days. That's not on the eighth day yet. That's seven and a half. You know? So it's seven. I, I believe what he's aiming at there is to say it was about a week later. right? So it's an approximated time in both passages. It's just in one day after six days fully completed and not yet to the eighth day. It's about eight days. So that's, I'm showing you that because sometimes people raise an issue, not an issue. And then one other thing I want you to see in Luke 9, or forgive me, two things here. Luke 9, 28, it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and James and uh, John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. We don't have that information in Matthew, but he took them up there to have a prayer meeting on a mountain. Now you don't have to pray on a mountain, but if you have a mountain, why not pray on it? <laughs> right? You're literally closer to God. <laughs> so head up on the mountain and pray if you can. Verse 29, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Now watch this in verse 32. But Peter and they that were with him, James and John, were heavy with what? <laughs> and this great event, and they're taking a nap. <laughs> oh, man, how much you miss out on in a prayer meeting because <laughs> you got sleepy. You'd like to think they learn, but when they get to Gethsemane, guess what they were doing? Guys, wake up, man, wake up, watch and pray, watch and pray. Something big is happening here. All right, now come to 2 Peter 1 and verse 16. 2 Peter 1, 16. So now we're going to have it straight from Peter's pen. Verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? Eyewitnesses of His what? Majesty. What did Jesus say? What was the prophecy? There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. So what Peter, James, and John saw, Peter tells you what they saw right here. We saw the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when they were eyewitnesses of His majesty. So the prophecy was not about seeing the kingdom completely established and set up on the earth. The prophecy was about seeing the glorified Jesus coming in His power and majesty. They were given a glimpse of what Jesus will be like when He comes to establish the kingdom. So this is Peter telling us how to understand that prophecy. Now, we know this is the context. Just keep reading here in 2 Peter 1, verse 17. For he, talking about Jesus, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's the story of the Mount of the Transfiguration, which we're about to read now. Verse 18, and, the, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. That, that mountain there on, uh, praying on there. All right, so come back to Matthew 17. So I believe the most biblical way to understand the prophecy, it's not a failed prophecy by any means. It was fulfilled a week after Jesus said it. Some of you guys standing here, you won't taste of death till you see the glorified Jesus, the, the way he's going to appear when he comes in the kingdom. So chapter 17 and verse 1, forgive me, I'm going to pause and just point to the board for a second. I've given you the breakdown there. If I, I tried to encapsulate the chapter by saying manifestations of divinity. There are different ways that you see Jesus showing his power and who he truly is. Verses 1 to 9, the transfiguration. Verses 10 to 13, fulfillment of prophecy, which is a major factor for divinity. God himself in the Old Testament said, if you want to prove 
who is the right God, then give him the test of prophecy. If a God cannot prophesy and fulfill the prophecy, then not, not a God to be feared. Verses 14 to 21, power over devils. 22 and 23, the death and resurrection. And then 24 to 27, I've written temple tax. Guys, we're not going to finish this chapter by any means. I'm just introducing it. But you remember the story with the, with the, uh, the coin in the fish's mouth. That, that's a fancy way to pay taxes, right? I mean, I don't know if you ever struggled to pay SARS, but <laughs> you're welcome to to do it. You can go to the dam and go fishing for a while and see if you find that tax money, but that's certainly a, a nod to his divinity. All right, chapter 17 and 1. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother. Those, those men represent the inner core of the apostolic group, right? So you have the 12, then you have the three, and then there's the one. Who can tell me, who, who was the disciple that Jesus loved? That was John. So you have the 12, the 3, the 1. And you're going to find throughout the scripture how God breaks things down into three levels like that. You bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Right? And, and you have the commandments in the Old Testament, 613, 10, but two great commandments. And God often puts it into tears like that. All right, so he takes this core group up on the mountain. Verse uh, 17 and 1, bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. We know they were up there praying, or supposed to be. Verse 2, And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. All right, if you would allow me just a, a quick practical moment here. Folks, get in the prayer closet until you see Jesus in all his glory. Get in there until you see him in, in a new way. And... You understand that this is that, that personal time you take with him. They went into a high mountain apart. Sometimes you need to pull away from everything else that's going on in life and get up there in the mountain and just seek the face of God and, and let him get richer and deeper and sweeter to you. He will show you things about himself that you had not yet seen. These disciples, were they devoted? Sure. Did they know the Lord pretty well? Were they still learning? Yep. They didn't know this. They had never seen Jesus in this way. They never saw him in this light. So I would highly recommend, just a, just a practical nugget, but that, that was what God was trying to accomplish by getting them up on the mount. Say, gentlemen, I want your focus to be on him because there's so much more to Jesus than you have even yet to see. You already know he's the Christ, the son of the living God. Now you've heard that he's going to die. You don't believe it, but he's going to die but there's so much more to him. So he was transfigured. Now, I've written it on the board in, in green marker there. The Greek word behind transfigure is metamorphu. Metamorphu, that's the, the root word, that root Greek word. You find it in other places in the New Testament. Let me show you a couple. Come to uh, uh, Romans 12. I think that's the verse I want. Yeah, Romans 12. Get Romans 12 and verse 2. So Jesus was transfigured. So that prefix trans means you're leaving one thing, going into another thing, crossing a border, if you will. And transfigured, you're going from one figure into a different figure. You're taking on a new appearance in this case, a new form. Romans 12, verse 2. Same word. Verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Right, transfigured, transformed, it's the same Greek word there. We would, in English, we actually anglicize this word to say metamorphosis, right, to go through a great change. He says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right, what are we supposed to do as Christians, the main goal? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was transfigured, right? So was he already glorious in his human form? Sure. I mean, the things he could do? That's made him stand out above the rest. But now, that, that gets kicked up to another level here. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, the reason I point that out is just as, as Jesus was transfigured, we also, we also should strive for this sort of change in our life. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. Paul says, But we all, with open face, beholding, as in a glass, which is a... It's a uh, figure of speech. He's pointing to the Bible there, actually, to the Scripture. 
beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. When you read the Bible, you look for His glory. The Bible will tell you how great He is. So 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, When you look in, into that glass and you see the glory of the Lord, it says you are changed into the same image from glory, that's your glory, to glory, to His glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So as you spend time looking into this mirror, right, it shows you the Lord and you are changed to become more like what you see in the Bible. Now, if you want that change to happen quicker, you, you put your odds up the more time you spend with your face here in the Bible, right? Looking at that, at that uh, glory of God. All right, come back to Matthew uh, 17 now. Matthew 17 and verse 2. And he was transfigured before them. Now, forgive me, I, I, didn't make a, I didn't say it there, but in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, where it says, we are changed that word change, that's metamorpho. That's that same word. So transformed, transfigured, changed, that's what you're dealing with. Matthew 17 and 2 was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. All right now, you can write down next to that where it says he's, he looks like the sun. You just write this one down, then I'm going to show you a couple of verses. Get to Revelation, well, you can write down Revelation 1 and uh, verse number. Verse number 16, his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. I, I've shown you these verses before, so let me just mention it. Psalm 19 talks about Jesus, or it talks about the bridegroom there, but it's actually a good reference to Jesus. But it, it references the sun is as a bridegroom, as a strong man running a race. and So there's a connection there with Jesus. Get Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4, verse 2. Malachi 4, and verse 2. It says, But unto you that fear my name shall the S-U-N, capital S-U-N. Well, the capital gives it away, right? You know that we're, we're talking about deity here. So this is a reference to Jesus Christ, but he's called the S-U-N. The Son of Righteousness arise with healing in His wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I'm reading that verse with it because in Romans 16 tonight, you're going to see a verse about this, about the saints treading out the wicked. But there you go. It's a reference to the second coming. When Jesus comes back, he comes back as the S-U-N, Son of Righteousness, shining in His strength and burns up the wicked in His path. All right, let's come back to Matthew 17. All right, so His face did shine as the sun, and His raiment was white as the light. So He goes from these dusty, dirty, earthly uh, uh, rags that He's wearing. Jesus was not a rich man. You know, He, he has on just your basic... Clothing from whatever, Edgar's or whatever he has. It's nothing nice. And, and, but now all of a sudden, bam, he's got this, the, the garment is, is shining basically. His face is like the sun. It's just a different version of Jesus. It is the same man, just a different figure. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Now Luke told us what they were talking about. They were talking about his decease that was going to happen at Jerusalem. So Moses and Elijah, they show up. Now, I've got to get a couple of verses on this. Hurry back to the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. When Jesus shows up there on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, you are getting a foretaste of, of the tribulation and the second coming of Christ. And that, that's why Jesus was showing them that. It's a fulfillment that you won't taste of death till you see these future things. Zechariah 4. Now you guys remember this in verse 3. There's two olive trees and they're emptying themselves into this golden candlestick. And then come on down to verse 11. Zechariah 4, 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? I love, that's a cheeky angel. 
Right? I mean, he just asked him twice, what is this? Hey, what is this? Oh, you don't know? <laughs> well, that's why I'm asking the question, right? Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones. Right? These are the olive trees, emptying the olive oil out. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Here on the Mount of Transfiguration, who's standing right next to the Lord of the whole earth? You have two, two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. I right, come to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, and let's begin looking at verse 3. Revelation 11 and 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. There's Zechariah 4. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. This is where we get the idea of fire-breathing preachers. This is the passage that it comes from. Fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not the days of their prophecy, Elijah. And have power over waters to turn them to blood, Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues, Moses, as often as they will. Now, there's more to be said there, but those two witnesses, there's little doubt. There's no doubt as to who that is. It's Moses and it's Elijah. They're the ones standing by the God, the Lord of the whole earth. So the Mount of Transfiguration, there, there's multiple things that are being revealed in that event. All right, Matthew 17, let's just close it up here. Matthew 17 and verse 3, Moses and Elijah are talking with the Lord. So guys, this is a, a literal thing that happened. It's in a historical event. Those two men appeared, and they're talking with Jesus. But there is an allegorical um, lesson to be learned. Jesus is standing there, and he's talking with the law and the prophets. Because that's what Moses and Elijah represent. They are used in that way, actually. In, in, in the Gospels, in the, in the Old and New Testament, it's refer they are referred to in those ways. Moses and Elijah, they work together. It, it, it encapsulates the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. So what do we have? You have the Old Testament bearing witness to what's about to happen in the New Testament. It's bearing witness in the Old, in, in the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, you can find the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But what's, what Peter, James, and John are getting a glimpse of is, guys, if you want to verify what I've just said a week ago about dying and rising again, Go check with Moses and Elijah. That's where you're going to find the evidence for that. So all of this was a bit of a, a, a nod to that. Say, so, hey, hint, hint, go look there. So we'll pick, up, pick that up more next week. All right, good enough for tonight. Any questions on any of this stuff? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and based on um, the rewards that's going to be on us out by the number to which that's going to be when the wedding is and then he's going to come down for the kingdom mm -hmm. um, and that death is going to be the lake of fire well the, the, the death that he mentions in verse 28 which shall not taste of death till so by using the word till or we would say until these men will taste death but not until, right? So they, they first have to see what Jesus is talking about. Then after that, they will eventually taste death. So that, that takes the second death out of that, that equation. Yeah, because those men never tasted the second death. Yeah. All right, anything else? Okay, let's take a break. Take about five minutes, six minutes, and then we'll come back.